You gotta let me down slowly Can you at least take the memories Am I asking too much Like an old country song Welcome back to the Gentleman's Dojo. To my left from Detroit, Michigan. Yes. Here's the body of a cubicle worker. (laughs) Thank you. Gary Cannon. To my right from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Must be very excited. Super excited. His pens are in the finals. Oh, yes. Looking good. Looking good. Big game tonight. Steve Byrne, everybody. Yeah, and joining us today... This to my, a, yeah. Good, good, yeah. Oh, yeah. your dad is here. My father's here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad's sitting in, and my dad is sitting in with us because of our very, very special guest today. And he actually is the one that is playing us into the dojo today. Yes. NHL legend, I am beyond excited, Mr. Theo Fleury. To the dojo. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. I told you before we started, I said I usually am not nervous going into one of these, but a uh, little intimidated right now. You should be. This guy could beat the shit out of me. I know. <laughs> and by the way, let you me just your whole say this. Fa- like, like literally your family could team up again. And let me <laughs> let me say this, because I know your dad, this is his first time on the air with us. Yes. Uh, tell him to be nice. My mom has been nothing but respectful towards oh. you and your career and everything that you haven't done. So just know this. that You can I go fuck your, yourself. I think your dad, <laughs> okay. great language, Pops. No. Great language Shut right up. there. Yeah. <laughs> Raised him well. Uh, but Theo Fleury, I... Obviously, grew up watching you, love watching you, uh, amazing hockey player, and I'll never forget, I, I had the honor of doing the Lemieux Fantasy Camp. Bill Burr and I went and performed, we did some stand-up, and then we got to go to some games, and I got to sit next to you for a few minutes, and I remember asking you, and I think this kind of summed up what you were thinking, what you were feeling, I said, uh, you know, with your stature, uh, was there any guys you were scared of ever playing against? And you said, you looked at me dead in the eyes, you go, they were all scared of me. And then you got up and walked away, and I was like, now that's a man. That's a man, and now I want to sue my parents. <laughs> Unbelievable. But, it, I mean, that's that was un- it just like, boom, reflex, there it is. Can you explain to Gary what it's like to be coordinated or an athlete yeah. at all? Uh, well, it's, I just need a little insight. It's, <laughs> it's really good for your bank account. Yeah, <laughs> I was always the last guy picked for everything: kickball, women's softball. <laughs> <laughs> always the last guy. Now, what you played, obviously, for uh, your son. When I think of you, I instantly think of you scoring that goal and sliding yes. on the ice, yes. e- elation, joyous. That is when people say Theo Fleury, I think of that. That's some of the first clips that come up when you put his name in. It's crazy. Oh, you did five minutes of research. Thank Here you, we Gary. go, in front of our guest. Let's Hello. save it for yeah. when we're off the air. You know, I think all of us who have a long, distinguished career, you know, there's sort of one goal that defines our career. You know, Mario going through those two Minnesota guys, scoring that goal in the in the playoffs. And, you know, that was sort of my iconic moment that, uh, yeah. that happened. And... Uh, you know, obviously, the Battle of Alberta made it even larger, you right? Know, because, uh, and that series was, I would say, one of the greatest seven game series ever played in the history of the National Hockey League. Because, um, you know, Calgary and Edmonton are both in the province of Alberta, mm-hmm. and in the '80s, the Stanley Cup went either through Calgary or Edmonton, and right. in the '80s, and so there was. Uh, a mutual hate for one another. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I remember getting dressed in the dress room before those games, and it was like we were putting on, you know, a suit of armor and, uh, you know, going on the battles of Falkirk with Mr. Braveheart himself because right. it was it was barbaric. It was, uh, you know, when you slash somebody, it was with the intent of, breaking somebody's bone or you know what I mean that's <laughs> right yeah that that was the nature of of the the rivalry mm-hmm. and so to be able 
and we were down three games to one in the series. Uh, right. We won game five in Calgary and then went back to Edmonton, and it was back and forth. It was a close game, 1-1. One, one, and and uh, <clears throat> Messier, who was playing for the Oilers at the time, put a perfect pass right on my tape, and, uh, you know, I went in and scored on Grant Fuhr. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, the excitement, uh, which I felt, uh, you know, resulted in, in, uh, you know, in that celebration and it's become, you know, very famous. It's on every Saturday night in hockey night in Canada on the yeah. prelude to, to hockey night in Canada. And so, uh, yeah. And, and, uh, wherever I go, you know, people, that's probably the first thing they mention is the goal, you know? Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been, um, you know, I had a, I had a great career, you know, and, and, uh, enjoyed uh playing the game i enjoyed playing uh intense fierce um you know i was highly highly competitive guy which made me um like i said when i gave you that answer at mario's camp i wasn't lying yeah. i wasn't lying you know no, i could tell is that, <laughs> i could definitely tell Theo. is that uh you know when you're five foot six and the average height is six over six feet and 200 pounds, you know, obviously I was way below that. And for me to be able to do what I did best, which was, you know, play skillful hockey, score goals, make plays, I needed to get room on the ice. Mm -hmm. And how do you get room on the ice? Well, you have to intimidate the big guys and be unpredictable, right? They didn't know whether I was going to kiss them or cut their eye out, right? And right? That's what I wanted them to think when I was on the ice, right? And and that allowed me to get room and and allowed me to play that high skilled game that 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 I ended up playing. Who was who was in your opinion the best player that you played against that you really admired? Well, <clears throat> obviously Wayne Gretzky's my idol, right? And uh you know, I've had many opportunities to play against him and many opportunities to play with him. And, and uh, you know, and, and getting to know Mario over the last, you know, five or six years and, and realizing the impact away from the ice that Mario's had <clears throat> in the city of Pittsburgh mm -hmm. is pretty incredible. You know, what he's done with that foundation and, and how humble a guy he is and and uh you know i have a lot of respect uh for that and, yeah and it's really cool to you know to go to that camp and and spend some time with him and and uh see how gracious he is to to everybody there is an air of royalty almost to him yes. where he is he He's is the man. just a classy guy <clears throat> and you think of all the incredible athletes that have played in pittsburgh you know roberto clemente and willie stargell and the pirates and then you Terry Bradshaw, Lynn Swan, and all those guys that played in Pittsburgh, and he's at the top of that list. Right. You know, in, in a sport that, uh, you know, has taken a long time to sort of, you know, have its own niche, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in the American market because, you know, there was a time when hockey in the United States was like the 15th most popular sport. You know? Right. And now it's considered one of the four major sports uh you know in the world and i think that's really cool and and it's guys like gretzky and lemieux that have you know made it that yeah way. it does seem just as of recent you can find the nhl finals on a network channel because it wasn't that long yeah. ago where the finals were on and it was on some weird random cable channel that if you didn't have direct tv you couldn't get it mm -hmm. so it's just kind of bizarre thank you for that side note gary go ahead well, and, and <laughs> Aaron, we edit that part 923. Remember that? Mark that. We always go like that. Absolutely no contribution whatsoever. And, and talking to your dad before yes. we did this, you know, he started playing hockey on roller skates and mm -hmm. absolutely fell in love with the sport and the game. And, and uh, you know, I played with a guy in Calgary who's from Hell's Kitchen, a guy named Joey Mullen, who, oh, yeah. started, uh, <laughs> who started on roller skates and became... You know, the highest before Jeremy Roenick uh, mm -hmm. and, and Mike Medano passed him, but he was the number one American-born sc scorer, and he w started playing ho roller hockey in Hell's Kitchen, New York. So, you know, it's just once you get a taste of 
of hockey, it's uh, it's tough to get out of your system. Well, even here in Los Angeles, when I moved here just, you know, 10, 12 years ago maybe, nobody was wearing King stuff. And now you go down, especially Manhattan Beach, yeah. all the play, yeah. everybody's wearing King's things. And I, it's great to be here in Los Angeles because everybody says it's the best live sport. Um now that you're so far removed from the game, it's been years. I'm, obviously, you're still playing, but do you still sit down and watch, or is that like I don't want to go back to the office? No, no, I I like to watch. And and, and, and who's your pick this year? Well, obviously, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, when the Flames aren't, you know, in in the playoffs, mm-hmm. uh, you know, obviously, I'm a I'm a Pittsburgh fan because of God, I love you. You know, the last <laughs> I love everything about you, Mister Flurry. And and not only <laughs> that, I I am the most hated guy in San Jose. So, (laughs) you know, uh, uh, I think if you look at all my career stats, with the exception of me playing in the the old Smythe division for so long, Mm -hmm. um, I probably have the most points against the San Jose Sharks. And we had an epic playoff series that went seven games. uh, I think it was in uh, 95, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lost the first two games at home in Calgary. We finished like 30 points ahead of them in the standings. Right. And we went back to San Jose. We beat them 9-2 the, the game three. Wow. And then 6-4 uh, the second game. And I had nine points in those two games. So uh, wow. there was a, a real distinct hate uh, for Theo Fleury <laughs> in San Jose. <laughs> and every time I touched the puck, the whole entire crowd would like, Boo me and uh, right. I, lo- I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what of all the arenas you played in? What was your favorite city to venture into? I think any or- original six team. You know, um, I love the old Chicago Stadium. Mm-hmm. It was uh, it was incredible. Montreal Forum, Boston Garden, Madison Square Garden. Um, you know, those buildings were they were unique. You know, they were all different and they were all unique. You you walk into a a building now they're all the same mm-hmm. you know they 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 don't have that character they don't have that history you know you know you you go into the Montreal Forum and you see those 24 Stanley Cup banners or you go to Boston Garden and you see all those Celtic banners you know that are yeah that are in the you know the Great Western Forum back in the day was unbelievable when, when Gretzky first came to LA man it was unbelievable to come here and play and and see because when we used to walk out of the dressing room there used to be all these uh, famous people that were hanging around because they used to sit on the glass, right? right. And, uh, you know, I was a huge Rocky Balboa fan, like huge, mm-hmm. you know, because our story, stories are very, very similar. And I remember meeting Sly St- Stallone for the first time, and I was just, like, blown away. And, you know, John Candy came in the room one night, and it was just, it was unbelievable. It's, you know, small-town kid from Canada. Yeah. You know, uh I remember uh, when the first Rocky came out, it, it played in my hometown. We had a little small theater in our, in our hometown. And I remember after the movie, man, I ran home and I was like shadow boxing <laughs> and I was just like pumped. Gary you know? did the same thing after Flashdance. <laughs> <laughs> he was doing pirouettes, I believe. And uh, I was so pumped. Swinging on a big piece of meat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. It was hot. Yeah. Um, and then you made the transition into country music. Uh, post hockey years, can you explain? I, I, I got to ask you, what is what what makes you more nervous? A game seven, or taking something that you actually wrote and performing it live in front right. of people? That something that's so personal. Mm-hmm. W- what is what is the difference, or maybe similarities even in being a country musician? Well, I think and a the, I think the preparation is the same. Like going, doing a show is the same prep, you know. But mm-hmm. I don't think you can be any more vulnerable. Being right. a singer and yeah. singing about your life and and your uh, you know the lyrics or whatever. So, but I don't get nervous. You know, I I think I I was born to be an entertainer, and whether I'm doing motivational speaking or singing or you know playing hockey or whatever it is, uh, you know, it's just part of my DNA, and it's something that uh, you know from the time I was you know six years old and. You know, playing hockey in Canada, I was scoring, I don't know, three to ten goals every game. And, it, you know, as soon as I would come out of the dressing room, everybody would be pointing, oh, there he is, that's that guy. You yeah. Know? So, you know, you just get used to it. And, and uh, it's it's a part of, you know, what you do. 
And did you grow up playing guitar as well, or you just always had a <clears throat> deep fascination or uh, appreciation of country music? Well, Obviously, Calgary <clears throat> is huge country town. Well, you know, I my home life was uh, pretty chaotic. Mm -hmm. So both my parents struggled with addictions. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom was a prescription pill addict, and and so life was chaotic. Right, and and so. My fondest memories as a child were sitting beside my grandfather, listening mm -hmm. to him play the fiddle, and uh, and you know this incredible scene because uh, my uncle had a farm about thirty miles south of where I grew up, and we used to go there every Sunday, and it was lo overlooking the Assiniboine Valley and uh, river flowing through and and. No matter what was going on in my family, as soon as the fiddles came out and the guitars came out, my family just came together. And yeah. It was just, you know, this really cool scene, mm -hmm. you know. And <clears throat> I always loved the fiddle, and I always loved country music, you know. And so they would sit around playing old Buck Owens tunes and Georgie Jones and and Johnny Cash and, you know, Willie Nelson. And so... So that was my sort of musical influence, and and uh, and so after I retired and I wrote my first book, uh, there's a friend of my brother. They used to play hockey, and this kid, who my brother used to play hockey, was a phenom hockey player. Mm -hmm. And when he was 12 years old, somebody bought him a guitar, and he quit playing hockey, and basically spent the next five years in his bedroom playing this guitar. And so he's become this very famous uh, writer and producer out of Winnipeg. And so I called him and I said, hey, listen, I want to stroke something off my bucket list. I said, would you be willing to write a song with me? And he said, yeah, absolutely. He said, but there's one stipulation. He says, we play musicians hockey Tuesday and Thursday so while you're here <laughs> writing the song you got to come play hockey with us and so I went to Winnipeg and and that song you played was the oh, wow. song was the very first song I ever wrote uh with him oh wow and and our dads used to play music together before we were even born so mm -hmm. you know there's lots of really cool um stuff and and so we wrote the song he sent it back to me finished and I listened to it I was like man, this is pretty good. So I phoned him and I said, do you think this is good? He's like, yeah, it's great. And I said, well, would you like to continue doing more writing? And so I kept going back to Winnipeg and writing songs. And and then uh, one of my old drinking buddies and partying buddies in Calgary, uh, I didn't even know he was a musician when we were partying together. Yeah. So we both get sober and, uh, and he says, you know, we should write some songs together. And so... Um, you know, the title track for the album is called I Am Who I Am, and he came over to my house, and we wrote that song in a half an hour. Oh, wow. And, uh, and yeah, so I have two incredible writing partners, and and uh, Patty put the band together. It's all guys from Calgary, and, and uh, we just got off uh, our first tour. And oh, congratulations. Yeah, it was, uh, it was awesome. So it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it, and it's a great way to... Uh, you know, get some things off my chest that I think uh, yeah. I needed to, to get off my chest. And, you know, obviously the first album's pretty dark, and <laughs> and uh, but that's what country music... That's country, that's yeah. That's what country music's all about. And, and, uh, and yeah, we sort of have our own sort of... Uh, we call it hockey tonk instead of honky tonk. <laughs> so, and uh, and it is. It's got its own unique sort of sound and beat to it. And uh, you know, it's like that old sort of rockabilly stuff that yeah. uh, you know that I grew up listening to. Um, it, have you always been a straight shooter? Because you, obviously, you're a very honest person. You and I, I don't know. Was was writing the book "Playing with Fire" difficult for you? I, I read it a few years mm. ago. I'd gotten it as a gift and. Uh, I didn't anticipate what I was going to right. read into into it, which which leads to why you're here, yes. and we'll, we'll discuss that mm -hmm. in just a second. But I wanted to just ask you, how difficult or maybe cathartic was it right. doing writing, playing with fire, and then being so open, which I think mm -hmm. opened up yes. you to what what you're doing here. Um, I've always tried to be straight shooter, 
and, mm-hmm. and honest. And, and a lot of times it's got me in trouble with the media because, you know, yeah. I, you know, because most hockey players aren't open. And, yes. And honest, you know. Very exciting after game uh, <laughs> interviews yeah. with hockey players. Couldn't be more, more, more yeah. boring, but yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like the uh, Dave Killer Carlson interview on uh, the movie Slapshot, you know, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, yep, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, you know. And, uh, but I think our job as professional hockey players is, you know, part of our job is to sell the game. Yes. And so to explain. The game to the fans. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Well, you do that through the media and the questions that you're asked, you know, after a game. And so I always felt it was important that we, you know, are also selling our game as well. And so, um, and writing the book was, uh, I would say at the beginning, uh, very difficult Mm -hmm. because I didn't, I didn't know if I wanted to go where the, where it needed to go. Right. Um, you know, I was still, I was newly sober and so I was really raw and, uh, you know, I, I had forgotten a lot of my story, Yeah. you know, and, uh, thank God I had three buddies that came in and sort of put the timeline together because I, you know, uh, at the end of my hockey career, it was pretty insane, Mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and so... And not only that, I wrote this book with a very famous Canadian Hollywood reporter. Mm -hmm. And so she'd interviewed the biggest stars on the planet. So she knew how to get that vulnerability out of me and, and, uh, and whatnot. And, and so, yeah, playing with fire came out and, and, uh, and I can tell you four days before I was going to Toronto to launch this book, I was shitting in my pants because (laughs) I was like, you know, what have I just done here? Right. You know, and. I didn't know how all of you were going to react to the Mm -hmm. book. And so there was some intrepidation and I felt anxious and pretty raw and and alone, right? Because I'm telling something that, you know, nobody wants to talk about. Right. And, uh, and I love telling this story because, um, you know, I believe that there's a plan for all of our lives. And, uh, you know, I always say when I run my own life, it's the biggest shit show on the planet. Right. And so, you know, we're all see, we're all out there trying to find purpose for our lives. Mm -hmm. Why, why do we go through struggle? Why do we have bad things happen to us? And, and so we sort of feel sorry for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We play the victim, you know, and, and. And so that's what I was searching for. I was searching for, you know, why did all this shit happen to me? Right. And and when's it all going to make sense? Mm-hmm. And so I show up in Toronto at this first book signing, right? And I had zero expectations. You know what I mean? I'm not J.K. Rowling. I didn't write, you know, <laughs> Harry Potter. You right. know, it's just my life story, right? And so I show up at this book signing, biggest Indigo Chapters bookstore in all of Canada. And 400 people show up at this book sign, and I'm like, this is weird. Mm-hmm. You know, this is strange. And so I start signing books, and out of the corner of my eye, I spot this guy in line. He's got my book clutched against his chest. His face is buried in the floor, and he's walking really slow. So I follow him all the way through the line. He gets to the front of the line. He puts the book on the table, looks me in the eye and says, me too. Wow. And that's, and that's when I knew yeah, what the rest of my life was going to look like, right? Because when I retired from hockey, all I had was a grade 12 diploma from Vanier Collegiate in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And I had no clue what the rest of my life was going to look like. Right. And... I'll never forget this guy as long as I live because as much courage and strength that it took for him to get to that book signing to deliver this spiritual message to me and as much as he needed to say it, I needed to hear me too Yeah, as well. And, you know, since that first me too, we have had over 600 thousand other people either directly or indirectly say those two words Mm -hmm. as well and the me too i'm talking about is Mm -hmm. is the sexual abuse 
that I suffered as an adolescent by one of my coaches and and uh you know he raped me 150 times over a two and a half year period and obviously you know that changed the direction of my life because I was left with you know emotional pain and scars and and all this stuff and and trying to make sense of it all um and what happens to us when when we're left with emotional pain is that we sort of gravitate towards the dark side of life to deal with you know, these emotional things that are happening to us and these scars. And, and so, you know, that's how my story sort of went until I came to a point in my life where I, you know, I had a choice to make. Right. You know, was I going to die or was I going to live? And, and uh, you know, I had a failed suicide attempt and it wasn't because I wanted to die. It was because I was exhausted from living in emotional pain and suffering and trying to make sense of it all and I tried absolutely everything on the planet to make it go away and and uh and yeah it it, it was difficult you know it was difficult and what I realized very quickly mm -hmm. after the book came out was that I wasn't the only one right that there was millions and millions and millions of other people who had had the same experience as mine. And, and that's where the inspiration came to me was I knew that I could help people right through, through telling my own story and finding my own voice because finding my own voice, which I couldn't find for many years, what happened was empowerment came with me finding my own voice. And and I can tell you it's absolutely been the most incredible journey of my life. And, you know, to have this incredible, amazing documentary come out tomorrow. Yes. Um, you know, and you've seen the trailer. Like, it's powerful. Like, it's it's raw. It's honest. And it's so real mm -hmm. you know and Can we just mention real quick that it it is yep. the documentary is called victor walk and it is premiering june 7th 2 45 p.m at man's chinese theater that's 6925 hollywood boulevard um and you will be attending screening uh, obviously and doing a q a afterwards and it is tomorrow obviously at 2 45 at man's chinese mm -hmm. theater did you think that the book would springboard to you being here in Hollywood doing a documentary? No. It's crazy, right? I know. It's, it's, <laughs> uh, but you know what? It's amazing when you get out of your own way and just let it happen. What right. really happens, you know what I mean? And, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I surrendered and turned my life over to the care of whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and since I've done that, my life has completely done a 360 degree turnaround and uh and like i said you know we're saving people's lives yeah like we're literally saving people's lives and and uh what's more noble than that well you know? it's interesting too because you said when you were writing the book you had this sense of what's going to happen to it what's where's it going to go from mm -hmm. here and then even when you were going to toronto for that first book signing you have no idea are there going to be 10 people there are there going to be Five, who's going to be there? Right. Not only that, but are, is the community, because hockey is such a masculine sport, sure. is the community itself going to look at you and become a joke or a laughing stock? Right. And instead, obviously, it's done the reverse. And I think those victims out there see a superstar like Theo and say, God, if he can come out, if he's got the courage to, to come out and acknowledge what happened in the past, then maybe I can do it too. And I think that's what I got out of the trailer of the documentary, which to me, I got, I'm not going to lie, I got a little emotional on the back half because you see people coming out of the woodworks, hugging you, expressing pain, and, and maybe some sense of relief in it. So yeah, there's I no, really, I can't, I can't wait to see it myself. There's no question that uh, that, that moment, and it's the greatest gift that I get to see live, mm -hmm. is people getting rid of their shame. Yes. Because that's the biggest things that, that's attached to something like this is shame, right? And once you realize that it's not your shame to bear, that it wasn't your fault, 
You know, you really see people shift and change in a matter of 10 or 20 minutes, you mm-hmm. know, however long the conversation lasts. Sometimes it's even less than that, you know. And that's really what the Victor Walk documentary is really all about, is, is encouraging people, inspiring people to find their own voice. Because I know, um, well, you know, there's no secret that Michael himself is also a survivor of and uh and when we went on that walk you know there was four of us that had experienced sexual abuse and there was four people that hadn't experienced sexual abuse that went on this journey and i could say to each of us as a person and as a human being it changed our lives forever Mm -hmm. and uh and that's so powerful, you know, because I, I have, I'm an abor- I have an Aboriginal person. I have native blood in me and, and, uh, my ancestors walked wherever they had to go. Mm-hmm. And not only did they walk, they walked with a lot of stuff that they had to carry around. <laughs> right. right. But their lives were simple and meaningful. And, uh, it was about commun- creating community, creating team. Mm-hmm. Right. And I say that Everybody who is involved in the Victor Walk, what we're trying to do is create the greatest team that's ever been assembled on the history of the planet. And that's people who've experienced trauma in their lives. And and I know that one out of every three people who walk the face of the earth have experienced some sort of traumatic experience in their childhood. Mm-hmm. And And so trauma is the string which binds us all together as human beings, you know? And and why are we here? Why are we on this planet? We're here to help one another get to where we need to go or yes. get where they need to go. And you can't do it alone. I've tried and failed every single time. I've failed doing it on my own. And once I created a group of people and a team of people you know, I have the greatest life you can possibly imagine. And I never thought that that would even be possible. Right. Right. Because all I knew how to do was cope. Right. Whether I'm happy, sad, mad, or glad, all I knew was a feeling and I knew how to make it go away. Mm -hmm. And that was get loaded. Right. And so, you know, when you see homeless people on the street, I guarantee I could write their story Mm -hmm. because it's got trauma in it. Right. And there's always a reason for somebody's behavior. And that behavior is a learned behavior from childhood. Right. And so when I talked about my childhood, I used the word chaos. And you've watched me play hockey. When I stepped on the ice, it was pure chaos (laughs) that I created. But that's where I felt safe. Mm -hmm. That's where I felt normal. Right. And so, you know, this has been an absolutely incredible (laughs) journey. And really, you know, this journey is an inside job. The answers aren't out here. Right. The answers are all right here, depending on how far you want to dig and how deep you want to dig. That's where you'll find the answers. Well, I got to ask you, uh, obviously, anybody listening, go to YouTube, Victor Walk, is the name of the documentary. Watch the trailer. Trust me, you're going to see this. I was very moved by it. How did the idea for the documentary come up? And how <laughs> well, I wanna, long? I want to ask. Yeah. Uh, and how long has it been being put together? Yeah. Because because obviously there's the backstory that you divulge in terms of the personal experience. But then, how did yeah in terms of getting the documentary because you have to have a point A to point B. Mm-hmm. Yours was literally walking. It was uh, 250 miles, because we're here in the States, yeah. or 400 kilometers yeah. for Canadian mm-hmm. listeners. Yeah. Um, that's a hell of a distance. That's a, that's a <laughs> that's long car ride. ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what, who, uh, whose idea was it to, <laughs> to walk I would have done the miles? Victor fly. <laughs> that's, I would have <laughs> seen if I could have flown that. <laughs> and if, if there was, it, it would have to be direct. If it was a layover, <laughs> Gary's probably not in. I'm not stopping in Fresno. Yeah. <laughs> you got to keep moving. Yeah, so how did it come to be? That's... Well, I had a girl working for me uh, at the time who's a publicist, marketer, whatever. And uh, she said, you know, we should do something around this. And and so we talked about a walk. 
and uh you know me being a guy that uh likes a challenge you know i thought wouldn't it be great if we walked the long distance you know and wouldn't it be great if we ended up in ottawa on the front steps of parliament and you know bring the message to the people that can make the change mm -hmm. right and that's sort of how that idea came and then uh, we put it all together and we fundraised and we had two rvs uh on the trip and and uh and so this there was a guy named michael lynch who had called me shortly after my book came out and wanted to do the hollywood version of the theo flurry story and i said I was kind of like humming and hawing and so he came to Calgary spent a few days at my home and mm -hmm. uh you know we chatted back and forth and you know I just sort of came to the conclusion that I had a lot more left to accomplish in my life and I didn't want it to be solely about hockey I right. wanted it to be you know more bigger right and so we put the Victor walk together and I phoned him and I said hey listen we're going on this walk and I said I think it'd be a great opportunity for us to document the whole thing. And, you know, he jumped on board and, and the most amazing thing is that Michael walked the whole entire walk backwards filming us. I was just going to ask, <laughs> yeah, are the cameramen in the, in the minivan going along? Like, no, you know, no. but you're actually <laughs> doing shrimp. it with gear. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. With that camera and a GoPro, that's how we filmed the documentary. Oh, wow. And, you know, it was it was on like the first day we had this uh guy actually who walked here from the hotel <laughs> yeah <laughs> so he's staying in san diego so, yeah. <laughs> so the first day on this walk we started it at the child abuse monument in toronto and this guy has this monument in his front yard and that's where he displays it and he came on the walk with us and told this like incredible story about his life mm -hmm. like he was abused from the time he was born Ugh. until, you know, and he was telling us this story. And so the first day was, you know, we walked the whole entire walk on concrete because we were in Toronto, we were yeah. in the city. And, and then this doctor, Mike, showed up and told this, like, unbelievable story about his life. And we were all going, at the end of the day, like, our feet were like blistered and raw and sore and we're all sitting in the Winnebago and we go, we got nine more of these to go, you yeah. know, and we're like, what the hell have we done here? <laughs> yeah. You know, but as we went along, you know, people would literally pull up in their cars, get out of their cars, their heads would be down, da da da, and they'd come up to me and I'd grab them and I'd hug them and, and then I'd just listen to their story and then... They would leave leave us, and their heads would be out, up, their eyes would be brighter, their their mannerisms would be different, and that inspired us to just keep going and keep going. That was your fuel. Yeah, it was unbelievable because we were exhausted. Like, would you honestly. get a little angry that they were driving off in the car and you were still walking? No, no. <laughs> You're like, hey, can we just get a ride <laughs> <Not at all>. <laughs> <laughs> to the next pit stop? And there was another scene when, remember those kids? They gave us, they gave us, like, they were poor. Like, we were walking in the country, like, in these, through these towns and and places, and, and these little kids came up to us, and they had saved all of their money. And they their clothes were all ragged and torn up, and they gave us a jar of, of the money that oh. they saved. It was just like... And it was like every day it was like And that's that. ultimately who you're doing it for. Right? Yeah. I mean, you're, yeah. in some ways it's, it's redemptive that it's the children it's that are... It's unbelievable. It uh, really is unbelievable. What was the most difficult aspect in terms of making a documentary film or this particular film for you yourself as an individual? <laughs> well, I didn't do much other than, you know, walk and, and, uh, and tell, tell the story. Mm -hmm. But it's really Michael who you know, did an unbelievable job of putting it all together. Cause I don't, how many hours of video did you have to go through? I mean, we shot constantly. <laughs> yeah. Like he must've had a thousand hours that he had to go through. Go through right, edit, right. Through right? all the stories, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. And put it, put this story all together. So it actually made sense. And then the cinematography, the sound, you know, everything, you know, came together. So, 
You know, when you have somebody that cares that much about a project, you know, that's what you get. Right. right? You get you get powerful, you get in your face, you know, like God damn it, take a look at this shit. Right. Because it's happening. That just every, scared the shit out of me. <laughs> like it's happening every second of every hour of every day, all day long. Kids are being abused. Right. Everywhere. Not not only sexually, but emotionally, physically, you know, this is the biggest epidemic on the planet. There is nothing that I've come across that is any bigger than this. And I don't know why we refuse to put it in the spotlight. Yeah. You know, and then the movie spotlight. Yeah. That was a great start, but this documentary even goes deeper mm -hmm. than what the, than what Hollywood tried to expose. And as we know, Hollywood's been messing around with kids for years. Yeah. I was just going to say this is Corey Feldman had a book come out, I think yeah. a year ago and yeah. he tried to put a magnifying glass to the town itself. And I don't think it was as, I don't think people took it as seriously as they could have. Right. Um, exactly. But he said it's the biggest problem in Hollywood. And after it's reading the biggest him problem and, in society, period. Yeah. Period. You know, and, and, uh, it's really disappointing because we're better than that. If I may. Here, you got to speak on that. I was watching The Wizard of Oz with um, my granddaughter yesterday, and I, I can't look at um, Judy Garland and not be horrified at what they did to her. Yeah. It was horrible. And, and you're right. And, and it is this town part, partly to blame. But if you think about it, you wouldn't have gotten the notoriety if it wasn't for your NHL career. There's no doubt. Now, your NHL career has grown exponentially because of the good you're trying to do. Yeah. Most guys that leave the NHL, they go home and they're a big deal in the town and they play some adult hockey and this and that and the other thing. Right. And they're forgotten. I think this is a fabulous thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, because it's one thing to you know, be a hero on the ice and it's, you know, it's, it's something fun. It's communal, but you truly are becoming a hero and a lightning rod for all the survivors, but also the subject matter and getting it out there and hoping mm. that people become more aware of it. Yeah, there's no question. And, and, uh, you know, I wrote a second book to follow it up called Conversations with a Rattlesnake is what the book is called. And I wrote it with a neuroscientist mm -hmm. who's probably one of the most brilliant women, woman, that I've ever come across in my life who has humility and compassion and, and is incredibly bright. And, uh, as we were writing the book, you know, I realized four core beliefs I had about myself because of my experience mm -hmm. and, uh, and on a bigger scale, I would say most of us who've had a traumatic experience in our childhood feel this way. Abandoned and neglected, not good enough, not lovable, and do I even exist in the world is, is what we learn, mm -hmm. right? And that becomes the core of, of who we are and what we believe in ourselves. Until we have that sort of, you know, the light bulb moment where we go, you know what, I don't have to feel that way about myself mm -hmm. anymore, you know? I'm an adult now and I can change and I can actually change my brain. I can rewire my brain, uh, to think about myself in a different way. And, and that was, that's sort of the journey and the process that I've been on, but I've also been documenting the change. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have a great saying in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or Cocaine Anonymous. I belong to all the A groups, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Yeah. I, it. I'm a triple A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we have a saying, it's, it's attraction rather than promotion. Mm -hmm. And so by me sort of being out there documenting my life and people have seen the change, and that attraction brings them to me mm -hmm. 
which then creates conversation. Right. Right. You know, and that's really what it's all about. You know, we're in Hollywood with the biggest egos on the planet right here in Hollywood. Well, They're here in this room. Well, guess what? Guess what? You cannot lead anybody with ego. Right. Impossible. You lead with humility and compassion. Mm -hmm. Right. And one of the greatest things that I get to do now is I speak in maximum security prisons now to the baddest dudes on the planet, to rapists, murderers, child molesters, all this stuff. And you know what those guys have taught me? They've taught me compassion. Yeah. They really have. You know, because <clears throat> as I'm speaking to all these guys, you know, I look, I look at them in the eye and I see myself. 10 years ago, 11 right. years ago. And I go, holy shit, have I come a long ways. Yeah. You know? And and so there's a sense of pride. There's a sense of I need to continue this journey. Because, right. Because I have now, I have access to people. Yeah. I have access to people. And I have access to change people's lives and attitudes and, and stigmas. Mm -hmm. Right? And... And what people don't realize and don't understand is they think addiction lives in its own box. Trauma lives in its own box and mental health lives in its own box. Well, guess what? They all live in the same house. Right. Trauma happens, leaves us with emotional pain. And how do we deal with that emotional pain? Well, we, we drink too much. We eat too much. We work too much. You know, these are all addictions that people don't know. Right that they're actually doing because of their experience that they've had in childhood where they experienced trauma. And trauma is, is not sexual abuse. It's part of it. Mm -hmm. Trauma is bullying. Trauma is a death in the family. Trauma is divorce. You know, trauma comes in all shapes, sizes, and forms, which causes us, you know, to act out because we're in emotional pain. Right. You know, the most insecure person on the planet is the bully. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That's why he's doing what yeah. he's doing. Right? And, you know, and so, you know, mental health is also a huge epidemic on, on this planet too, you know. And, and uh, you know, with the U.S. being at war for the last how many years, you know, we've got veterans coming back who, who've experienced incredible trauma yeah right and so it's okay to talk about it you have you have to talk about it you cannot internalize it right because if you internalize it it turns into disease mm -hmm. cancer diabetes you name it because the trauma has to go somewhere in your body right and the trauma sits in a particular part of your body and it turns into disease right so you know, this is big. Like, this is huge. Mm -hmm. Trauma affects us in all different ways and shapes and forms. And we need to be allowed. We need to be given permission, you know. Like, I'm addicted to CNN right now because it's like, in Canada, it's the greatest reality TV show <laughs> on the planet, right? And not one candidate has mentioned the mental health Right. At all. And I'm like flabbergasted at the fact that nobody who's in a position of leadership would talk, like refuses to talk about this. Right. Well, I, I'm sure that they're in bed with the pharmaceutical companies. Of course. That are just pepper and all these, because my brother actually is a, is a vet who came back from Iraq and the government solution was to pepper him up with pills, and he had lost, I think, a friend or two, who Five. went down, the, but down the rabbit hole and ended up killing themselves. Never came back. Yep. Never came back. And my brother one day just decided, I'm going to flush these down the toilet. This is not my route. And now he's in programs that are helping yeah. him uh, through camaraderie, yeah. friendship, Team. other human beings Team. communicating. Yeah. Team. Can I bring Mike in one sec, Dad? Yeah. Do you mind switching out for one sec so we can ask Mike yeah. just as as we. Near towards the finish line, I want to get him in here so we can ask him a few questions as well. And Mike, you you directed, is that yes. correct? I directed, did. edited. He did. No, I, I didn't walked. I, I didn't edit this one. Paul Gordon edited this okay. one. Uh, I directed. Uh, you want these? Produced it. There you go. 
Directed, produced, and uh, I was a cinematographer. And did you come up with the with the idea to approach Theo and say, <laughs> "Hey, let's do this together"? Or how did you get involved? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, basically, I I was hitting a low in my my time my career as a filmmaker, and a friend of mine just told me I needed to do something I believed in. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just started playing hockey games. My brother had done intervention with me because I I'd taken a, I got too focused on work. Mm-hmm. Went back to playing hockey, and uh, I was going to write a narrative film. And, of course, uh, I'm going to go to do YouTube to do research. Who yeah. I look up? My favorite hockey player, Theo. I'm watching <laughs> his videos. And then I discovered he had just dropped a book like a month ago. Right. You know, and I, and I didn't know about the abuse. I remember when I was in Chicago kind of hearing about it. But, you know, you hear about the whisperings, and you don't believe it. You're like, oh, whatever. And then um, I reached out to his, his team at the time and, and tried to get a hold of them, spoke to them. They liked me. I was able to talk to Theo. We connected. And uh, uh, about a year later, we finally met at his place, like you mentioned, and we were going to do a, a movie version of it. And then mm-hmm. I wrote a full feature screenplay. Uh, and then um, as you see in the, the trailer, that's when Graham James uh, only got two years. Right. And so right when he got two years, that's when Theo and them, you know, he, he that's when he went back into therapy because he wasn't in therapy at that time. Mm-hmm. So he went back into therapy. I think that's when he met Kim Barthel. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he's like, let's pause this movie, you know. And so we paused the film. And uh, basically, yeah, he gave me a call and, and kind of, you know, we kept his friends and kept in touch. He gave me a call and told me what he was doing. He told me he was doing this Victor walk. And I said, well, maybe this is the most important thing that's in your life right now. So maybe what if we die? Because you were going to do the walk. You yeah. were just going to do it. We on- were going to do it anyways, right? Like the walk was oh, going to wow, happen. Okay. But I, yeah, I, he was already he was already doing wow. the walk. So the walk, and not only that, when I first met him, you know, even years before that, he'd already designed the Victor Walk T-shirt. He, he you know, after I first met met him, a month later, he had the Victor Walk tattoo on his arm. Mm-hmm. So this was like all unfolding, right? As when we were even writing the the feature. So, but when, once he was doing the walk. I was like, this is the most important thing in your life right now. Mm-hmm. How about, well, let, let's film this, let's document this. And he goes, yeah, let's do it. So then uh, I flew out, and at, at first, man, it was, you know, I mean, it felt like I was 17 again. You know, I had a, I had audio in my pouch, and I'm shooting with the <laughs> Canon 7D. Yeah. You know, I'd lob up Theo, and then I had a GoPro on my other hand, so I'd, so I'd get two angles. And luckily, though, I had Paul Gordon who came on. Uh, he, he came on and became my producing partner on this and the editor on this. So at least when I got back after after the... <laughs> 250 mile walk. Yeah, I was able to, you know, give him all the footage so he could help me uh, go through it all together. And how long did it take to go through all that footage? Because I'm sure with so many stories, there's so many impactful stories that you say we got to keep, but there's only just so much right. room in the film, right? Yeah. So I want to say we probably did like five months doing the first rough cut, mm-hmm. uh, and then after that first rough cut, uh, I actually had Paul move his edit bay into my house, and we probably oh, wow. did another. Like I basically then was like, we need to rewatch. All the footage again, wow. <laughs> like raw, and we we rewatched all of it. And then the first rough cut was only fifty eight minutes, and Theo saw that first rough cut. And then after that first rough cut, we after going through the raw footage, we made it ninety minutes, okay. which is well, the film's like eighty nine, but you know, rounded up. So yeah, you know, we end up getting it up to eighty nine minutes. Uh, and then right when we finished, we like finished the movie. It was done. You know, I get a call from Zorin. It was like, hey man, we got a second walk. You gotta fly out, man. <laughs> and, and so I called everyone up, like, hey, I know we just finished it. Call the composer. Call Anarchy Post, who did all, who hooked us up with our all our sound mix and design. Goes, so I know we just finished everything, <laughs> but I need to go shoot the second walk. And I think we're gonna add this like update section. Wow. So then in July of 2015, we shot the second walk. Okay. So we could have kind of an update because when I was doing test screenings of of the the early cut, people would always ask, "Did he do another walk?" Yes, he did another walk. So now they can ask, "Is he still walking?" You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so is we, there another we, walk planned? <clears throat> we pick a province every year. Yeah. And we walk across it. So this year we're going to do my home province. So we're starting in my hometown and we're walking to Winnipeg, which is 400 miles this time. Oh wow! Wow. Yeah. And, uh, I was just thinking in my head, oh, maybe I'll join. And then I heard 400. <laughs> maybe I'll meet you there. I'll meet you, you there. You can do the last day. Yeah. You know? yeah. I'll hold the scissors and the thing at the end when you guys are 400 miles. Now, how long does it take, by the way, to well, walk 200 miles? We've sort of changed it because the first walk was so grueling and demanding. Right. We were like kind of looking at each other going, well, we don't really want to do that again. Yeah. And so it's more of a Victor Walk rally. So, okay. So we'll walk. 20 to 30 kilometers during the day. Okay. 
over a five day period, but we'll stop in little towns and we'll do rallies where, you know, we'll come oh, in with great. our team, yeah. you know, we'll provide resources. I'll say a little speech, you know, da, 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 and then we'll go to the next town just to, you know, to boost that awareness that, mm -hmm. hey, the Breaking Free Foundation, which is what we've created from the Victor Walk, is here and we have resources and we have you know incredible following in social media we got bloggers we got everything going on and yeah. so and so we just want to let people know but really what we do is you most people can't afford professional help mm -hmm. okay so what the breaking free foundation does is you can write to us for a therapy grant and if you're approved we will pay for your first six sessions of oh, wow. professional therapy and we'll hook you up with the therapist as well. And uh, we got a donation last year of $100,000 to sort of get the program going. And so we've had our first four people go through the program. And uh, Oh, congratulations. And so, yeah, so we're, as we move forward, we'll be doing more fundraising. Part of the Victor Walk this year, we'll, you'll be able to donate to us. And, and, uh, and it all goes to people who... Uh, who need help. When well, is this one scheduled for? When is the Victor Walk this year scheduled for? I think it's July 23rd. Yeah, I think July 23rd. Okay. Yeah. And is that, you're hoping that is that become an annual event, yeah. right? Yeah, well, We're going to try and hit every province in in Canada over, because there's 10 of them over, over a 10-year period. So. And, and not only that, what he's also not mentioning is, so he, he does his walk where he changes, but there's other walks, like sister walks happening yeah. all over mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that keep building so that like other people who become advocates who maybe walked in the first walk, like Leftbridge and Toronto. So there's other walks still wow. happening yeah. as well. I and think and we anyone can go to the Victor Walk dot uh, com and sign up to bring a walk to their community where yeah. they could host We've one. We've got one in New York this year. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. Yeah. So... Well, think, just real quick, so so breaking free, how do people find these? So, so, so we have victorwalk.com. Victorwalk.com. We have the breakingfreefoundation.ca. Okay. Um, obviously, victorwalkdoc.com. Dot com. So there's, we're out there. And know. obviously, the documentary is going to be showing here in L.A. tomorrow, but where can people see it uh, that are listening at home? Post premiere, yeah. Well, uh after the world premiere, right. we'll start shopping into distributors. Okay. So we're nice. we're we're still in the middle of kind of figuring out what our distribution situation will be. Okay. But uh definitely, you know, um I see they're late this year or early next year as far as distribution cuz we probably might hit a couple, you know, we want to have Here's the a, problem though. Yeah. They're going to want more of this year's Victor walk in it. So then you're gonna have to keep updating it. It's gonna be an eight-hour film. <laughs> that or we, you know, we make just sure you put 2016 footage in there, yeah. <laughs> or or we can just periscope it. Yeah, there you go, <laughs> there you go. So I have easier. to ask you, as a filmmaker, what has been the most gratifying aspect for you personally, uh, knowing that you're going to see your film premiere tomorrow at Man's Chinese Theater yeah, here huge. in Hollywood? That's that's unbelievable. How what what's going through your head? Oh. um... I mean, I'm stoked that Theo's here. I'm stoked that Zoran's here. Um, you know, I had such a special time with both of these guys in the walk. And most of all, is when we've done the test screenings, mm -hmm. the best part about Victor Walk documentary is that it takes you right to the walk. You feel like you're on the walk with us. Mm -hmm. You know, I tried to avoid talking head interviews and made people, like, talk right. to me on the walk so they're walking. So I think the biggest thing is when we've had people come and watch it, they share their story. Yeah. Just like on the walk. So talking about the whole message of keeping the conversation going. With this film, unlike, a, say, another movie that maybe you make a narrative that has, inter you know, whatever, you get to really feel like you've helped someone. Mm -hmm. You get to feel like it is another therapy tool that, like, keeps thing, something going. So it's incredible that it is at the, the Chinese theater. It's incredible to have Theo here. And what's going to be more incredible is going to be at the Q&A. Is yeah. the things that people are going to say to Theo, the things that people, not are they going to say, but they might say in front of a room full of people that they're sitting next to when normally they might have wanted to just tell him privately. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's going to be the most gratifying experience is to hear people like they did in the walk come out for the first time. Well, but it was like what Theo said early when he went to the first book signing in Toronto. It was that first Me Too that really put it in perspective like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. Like this is really why I did the book. Right. Which is, you know, what 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 would you love for your legacy to be? Like what what's kind of that 
Like, what, what? What's your overall thought on that? I just want to be remembered as a good teammate. That's it. You know. That's well, it, it seems like you're a, a great teammate to humanity because mm. of what it is you're doing. Yeah, it's, I, not, it's. I'm not doing this because I want to be a hero. I'm not doing this for. I'm doing it because <clears throat> the more I help people, the more I heal my own self, and yeah. that's, you know, that's why, that's why we do this. Yeah. Right. Is is I've learned more about my life in the last seven years than I had at any point in my life. And, and it was, <clears throat> it was only because every night before I go to bed, I pray for willingness. Mm -hmm. And the willingness is to put somebody in front of me every day who's had the same experience right. that I've had. And I've never been failed once in seven years. There's that one either... Somebody's emailing me or Twittering me, Facebooking me, or just a chance meeting on the street. Right. Is that's what it's all about. And I and I and I can't say enough that if you get in that headspace, you get in that mind space, how much it's gonna improve your own life mm -hmm. more than anything else, right? Is you know, it's funny that the subject that you usually get involved in is the thing that you need to work on the most, right? right? And so, you know, that's been my experience, and that's been experience of everybody, you know. And and uh, it's absolutely just been unbelievably incredible. And you know, I'm from Russell, Manitoba, and I'm in Los Angeles, California, and there there's a documentary about what we're doing. Like that's yeah. how does that happen? Right? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But if you, you know, thoughts become things. And so you put it out in the universe, it's going to come back. Mm -hmm. And when it comes back, it's going to be directly in line with what your purpose is always, you know? And that's the, that's the power that this thing has is that, you know, people who come kicking and screaming into therapy don't know what they're you know, how amazing and how incredible it is to peel the layers of the onion off of your own life story. Right. Right. And when you do that, man, you can have, you can have so you can have such a huge impact on humanity and society as a whole. If you just, you know, the piece I think that, that is the key to all this is vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? How vulnerable can you be? How raw can you be? And, you know, I do tons of speaking in elementary and junior highs and high schools. And I tell kids, don't listen to the noise mm -hmm. because the noise has nothing to do with you. The noise has everything to do with them right. and how they're feeling. It has absolutely nothing to do with you. That's what I tell Gary every time he doesn't hear applause after his jokes <laughs> on stage. I'm like, don't pay attention to the silence, Gary. Well, Just hey, plow it's through. That, it's that not good enough sign. We always pick up the not good enough sign, yeah. right? Because we think that we're not good enough. Well, f God, like this is good enough. What yeah. we're doing is good enough. Yeah. You know? It, to add, you know, when he talked about the legacy, I mean, that was a big reason why it's called Victor Walk and not cool. Theo Walk. You know, is big and, and why the the frog that you know that we're wearing is is Victor the frog. You ever seen a frog hop backwards? No. It can look to the left. It can look to the right, but it's always going straight ahead. Ah. Uh. And that's, you know, that's why we chose the frog, right? You know, is that. There's there's one frog I guess that hops backwards, but other than that, every frog always right. goes forward, right? But uh, you know, there's lots of symbolism in everything that we, you know, that we do, and and uh, you know, there's there's an incredible scene at the end of the movie because uh, you know I I do tons of work in the Aboriginal community mm -hmm. in Canada, and. Uh, we got invited to the Sundance, which is like one of the most sacred ceremonies in all of Aboriginal culture. And uh, the scene at the end of the movie will absolutely blow your mind. And for us to get invited to that, because at the end of last year's walk, we ended up in uh, Siksika, which is the community where I'm a honorary chief. And... Uh, they've they've adopted me into their community and and we ended the last year's walk at this and we all got our 
we had this incredible traditional ceremony where we all got our faces painted and it's just oh like, that's great it's unbelievable so well i'm excited to see it i will definitely be there i'm really pumped to, and and you're an incredible conduit to healing and little did i know watching you out on the ice as a <laughs> as an agent of chaos to me sitting here with you today I would refer to you as Dr. Theo Fleury because you have a doctorate in life, and it's oh, amazing you. the gift that you're, the gift of vulnerability you're giving everybody. And to you, both of you, I cannot congratulate you enough. I, awesome. I'm so excited to be there tomorrow and do what I can on our end to be supportive of this of film. Course. So, Victor Walk, June 7th, 245, at Man's Chinese Theater, that is 6925 Hollywood Boulevard. And you will be doing the Q and A afterwards as well. Absolutely, yeah. and you will be walking, I believe, to Man's Chinese Theater. I will be walking. <laughs> yes, we're always walking. <laughs> well, I cannot thank you guys thank you enough, guys. and congratulations! Appreciate I can't it. wait to see it. All the best on this journey forward with this, and, and um, uh, I'll see you at Mario's camp again, hopefully. I don't know. I don't know. After the last one, I uh, I'm getting a little older. I don't know how you guys do it. I really don't. All right, let's play you it's off. It's called with... fake until you make it. That's right. <laughs>